Hello, City First Life Groups. I am so glad that you are joining us today. And you know what? Today, we are in this series called Red Skies, Signs of the Times. And what we are doing is we're talking about us as followers of Jesus, what is going on today in church and culture, and what is our part to play? What are we to do? In fact, in the Old Testament, the sons of Issachar were known for this. They were known as individuals who knew the times and they knew what to do. So we are asking some of our friends, some of the individuals that have ministered at this church and some that have ministered to our staff to speak into this subject of where's the church right now? Where's it going? Where's culture right now? And where is it going? And I am excited today. I'm excited because my lead mentor in my doctoral program is with us. And not only is he my lead mentor, but I will tell you for decades, he has been a theologian that has written dozens and dozens of books. He has taught countless times, traveled the world, and I just uh, am so appreciative of his investment into my life as well as thousands and thousands of others. So we have with us Dr. Leonard Sweet. And doctor, I am so glad that you are here. And I just, again, I've said this to our staff. I've said it to the pastoral team. Uh, I am eternally grateful for the investment that you've made into my life and also Jen's life, because as she was going through her master's program, you were also a professor and taught her. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, both of us have been profoundly, profoundly changed because of your investment. So thank you. Well, it's my honor to be here, Jeremy. Thank you for bringing me in and seeing you and Jen together. That's so fantastic. Well, I'm excited because the uh, life groups are going to be able to hear from you, someone who has invested into our lives and has really in many ways shaped uh, a lot of our theology and teaching and such like that. And in the next few moments, um, I'd like to ask you some questions about uh, about semiotics in a sense. Okay, which sure. Maybe, yeah. First of all, um, I don't know anybody on the planet who's more of an expert on semiotics than you. So can you just briefly explain to everyone here, what is, what is semiotics? Well, I think it, I just like to call it the art and craft of uh, connecting the dots and putting things together in a world that loves to take things apart and separate and categorize and, and differentiate. Semiotics is the ability to put things together so that they come together as a story and to be able then to tell that that story. And I believe that the greatest story, of course, is the story of Jesus. So I'm always about a biblical semiotics that can tell the story of Jesus better. But, but it's also a cultural ability to see, read the signs, what they're telling us. Uh, um, and one of the things that, you know, we talked about earlier was the way in which um, we are in a world where there's a surge of aging, mm -hmm. right? People are living longer. Um, the, the numbers of people that are older are getting, I mean, Japan is in the midst of a crisis because they've got a population basically that's not reproducing itself and filled with aged people. And, and so how in a world where there's an age surge, um, what, how, can we, um, how can we find a, a, a ministry and a, a kind of see that the, the third age, I call it third age from 60 to 90, mm -hmm is the best age of your life. It's when you're most creative. Studies have shown that creativity doesn't peak until 83. Wow. So if, if, if and I, if there may be chronic issues or something, you know, but it just in a normal, if you're just living a healthy whole life, um, there's no reason for you not to be creative and, and to, for your creativity to increase until 83. If you're over three, 83, you got a peak and, you may peak, but you're peaking at a high level. So still, um, so how, how do we how do we find uh, our, our meaning and purpose and and uh, fulfillment in this uh, third age? I call it sixty to ninety, and that's it's an exciting thing because a lot of people are in it, and um, and that's where our conversation about mentoring started. Yeah, well, that's good. Well, today we want to connect the dots. We want to be able to see the signs of the times. And um, in churches, at least in America, in the West, it feels like it's very silo. You have this age bracket, yeah. you have this age bracket. Yeah. Now, I realize you're not able to teach a preschooler maybe in the same way that you're teaching a 25-year-old or a 55-year-old or a 95-year-old. I understand 
you have to make it um, age appropriate. However, we have um, kind of, I, I think in my opinion, created walls between yeah, the yeah, ages. Yeah. Do you see in the church of the future, red skies, do you yeah. see something different? Yeah, absolutely. It's multi-generational. The church of the future, you will never have a one-generation mission trip. Hmm. You'll have multiple generations going on mission trips. Mission trips are where bonding takes place, where relationships form for life. And um, to have just one generation to go on a mission trip, I think. So I think we're and and we we are now setting a separate table for our children. The Jews didn't do that. They still don't do that. Uh, Jesus never did it. He never had a separate table for the children. You put the no. You let the children come here. They're going to eat with us. They're going to be with us. So I think I think we're the the whole separation by generations mm -hmm. is uh, is not part of the future. I think it's multi generational. And, um, and the more that we can do, I mean, in, a, in a Passover meal, every Passover, the moment a, a Jewish child is born, it has a place at the table. The mm -hmm. moment it is born has an equal place at the table to everybody else. And the Passover meal begins when the youngest child present, all right, think about this, the youngest child present is the call to worship. Well, how is this night different from all other nights? That's their question. They begin the meal. The youngest child present that can speak. That's the importance of bringing us all together so that everybody feels like they have a role, they have a part to play in um, whatever we do. And so I, I don't see the way in which we've siloed, as you so aptly put it, um, all these generations is the way we're going. I think it's going to be much more. First of all, generations, everything's going so quick. What is a generation now? Maybe yeah. it used to be 20 years. Now is it seven? I mean, years. If I that, mean, yeah. If, I mean, everything. So I, I think we, it, we need to talk about cultural moments, but I think the more we can do to find ways to bring the generations together and to give them common experiences and to learn from one another. How do we do that? Because it seems like, unfortunately, church many times follows culture. Culture right now tends to be um, catering, especially in um, some in trying to sell product and everything. Usually, is catering to the youngest generation, <laughs> you know. Um, and and I'm wondering if like like we as a church aren't following that in the sense that we tend to think the priority is just on on the youngest generation, but yet at the same time a lot of the authority and a lot of the influences in the older generation. I guess what I'm trying to set the table here is there just needs to be a collaborative effort. How does that look yeah, in the church of the yeah. future? I, th I think, well, the theology for me, it is what are you willing to lay down? And every generation has got to be willing to lay down something. You know, mm -hmm. every um, Jesus said, the greater love has no one than this, than that you're willing to lay down your life. Okay. Now, he's not calling us all to lay down our life. I, one of the things I love to do sometimes is um, when I mean, I'm speaking to a crowd, I say, how many grandparents do we have here? Okay, everybody loves to. Everybody, everybody's a grandparent, loves to be a grandparent. All right. How many of you love your grandchildren? All oh, the hands go up. You know, How many of you, you would do anything for your grandchildren? All oh, the hands go up. I said, how many of you love your grandchildren enough that you would give your life for them? I mean, literally, you'd lay down your life for them. The hands still go up. I go, how many of you love your grandchildren enough to lay down your musical preferences for them? <laughs> As everybody, you know, okay. It, it, isn't it interesting? I mean, we're, we're all like Peters. You know, he, he would go and to the death. He was going to go to the—he took a sword. He wasn't going to—he wasn't, he wasn't aiming for Malthus's ear. He was aiming for his head. Mm -hmm. He was going to go to the death to for Jesus, but he wouldn't lay down his reputation in front of a little servant girl. You know, it's the little things that betray us. So how much are we willing to lay? But every generation has got to lay down. What are, what are every one of us to come together as a family? We've got to learn to lay down some things. And the youth have to learn to lay down. Children have to learn to lay down. Adults have to learn to lay down. We all have to learn to. So what are we laying down that others can pick up who, who Jesus is? I, I my, my um, earliest kids were products of uh, Veggie Tales. Oh, yeah. Remember those? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, how I hated those things. <laughs> yeah, the songs are still stuck oh, in my yeah, head. Oh, yeah, they're earworms. I mean, you, just, you can't even make mention Veggie Tales, but it doesn't start yeah. buzzing. And this is not good music, okay? <laughs> so I wanted, every time a Veggie Tale video came out, I wanted to, you know, get out the Vegematic, you know, and just <laughs> kill it, kill it. 
But I, I turned my house into a salad bowl. I put that, I laid down 20 bucks to bring in these alien creatures, you know, <laughs> some of the most despicable creatures ever imagined by the human being into my house because I want them to pick up who Jesus is in the language of their culture, you know? Yeah. So I was willing to lay down so that they could pick up. And we've all got to be, but they've got to be willing to lay down too. You need to learn as a youth mm-hmm. um, some of the great songs of the faith. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how firm a foundation or um, you know, some of the, the great music of our ancestors. And, and we need to learn their music too. So it's a mutual laying down. And Jesus gave us that principle, lay it down, mm-hmm. lay it down. Mm-hmm. What are you going to lay down so others can pick up? What would you say to um, the younger generation? Mm-hmm. Because again, culturally, a lot of times the youngest generation is told that the oldest generation is, you know, maybe peaked already, or or to not look um, uh, forward to them and ask for advice and such. So, again, we're just hiving up. We're siloing our generations and our culture. What would you say to the youngest generation? What would you say to the oldest generation? And what would you say to everybody in between? Yeah, that's a really good. And I think I think in some ways the younger generation is right about the way in which we framed it because. We, we said, well, the older generations have the wisdom and the knowledge and the younger generations have the, you know, the enthusiasm and the idealism. And it's just reversed. Mm. I mean, experience now, you, you said, I, I have a wealth of experience. I've had 40 years of experience doing this. You know, uh, uh-oh, because what worked yesterday, I'll tell you, is not going to work tomorrow. So to, to boast that you got all the experience, we had to learn from your experience. Mm-hmm. No, the people with the experience are the kids. They know, they've got mm-hmm. the experience of what actually works. They, they know right. where the traction is. They know where the rubber hits the road, you know, especially about technology. So they've, they've got the wealth of experience. I mean, I, if I'm going to do anything with technology, I don't, I look to my kids. They're mentoring yeah. me. They got to mentor us. But at the same time, we have the hope and the ideal, which is what they're missing. They don't see hope for this future. They don't see things. They're not dreaming. What happened to the – so the older generation is going to teach them how to dream, how to hope, how that the best is yet to come. You can do this. So the enthusiasm that we used to associate with the kid now ought to be coming from the elders. And the youth, we ought to be looking to them for, okay, tell me what's going to work. Tell me – you know, how to make this work because I don't know, you know. So it's a – so it, it things have flipped, in other words, Jeremy. I mm-hmm. think that the older generation now ought to be the ones with the hope, the enthusiasm, the energy, the idealism, the dreaming. And the younger generation, okay, tell me what's going to work out this because I can't figure this thing out, you know. Yeah. No, that's good. And And every generation is necessary. Bingo. Every generation right. is needed. Um, it requires a, a lot of humility, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and we it, on both parts, on both parts. Um, and, but we, Jesus taught us this. I mean, he was constantly saying to disciples, "Sit at the feet of your children." You know, we need to sit at the feet of our children. And the children need to sit at the feet of the elders. Mm. And so, I, I have a. This year was a big year for me. I have two of my kids had children. All right, so I have. I'm a grandparent. Congratulations. And, um, so the question is, what do you call me? You know. Yes. Yeah, there's all so, kinds of names out there. Yeah, so I've been going with Ancestor. <laughs> it hasn't been working too well. But it's not because the kids won't do it. I mean, they're, they're still, they can't, they haven't spoken words yet. But but it's the adults, so you can't have your grandchild call you Ancestor. Well, why not? Why not? <laughs> they ought to have be brought up with a respect for their ancestors. And, the, and, and also... The, the, the ancestors can, are, are the story keepers, mm. and we're the ones that can keep the stories and tell the stories and, and pass on the stories, the baton of the stories. And, and so that's another role for that third age that is not being uh, conveyed is the story keeper. Mm-hmm. And in many ways, the story is the testimony, right? And in Revelation, it says there's power in yeah, that. Yeah, and that's where the hope is. That's yeah. where the hope comes from. Right, the story. Uh, at the same time, I, I see a lot of post-COVID um, 
depression, doom and gloom, a lot of, and I don't mean literal depression, although that's obviously there, but I mean, just generally speaking, that there's a cloudiness. It feels like the older generation or even the middle-aged generation is is stressed and frustrated, and I think that's being passed on to the younger generation. So we need to have hope. We're people of faith, right? Yeah, And absolutely. so we, we don't live by what we see on CNN yeah. or Fox News. We live by faith. Talk right. about that a little bit. How can how can the older generation and younger generation live more by faith? I mean, well, and this is where I think I, I love how you framed that because you know the first age I go zero to thirty. Mm-hmm. The question is, where do you go to school? Um, thirty to sixty, what do you do for a living? Sixty to ninety, the question is, what's the question? You know, right. and this is where I think the question is, how can I make the biggest difference for God? You know, mm. This is the age when you can really. But what the church tries to do is to look at that 30 to 60 year old group. They're the ones that are the they they're the ones that's most stressed. They got a, they're raising a family. They're trying to make a career. They're saving for retirement. They're they probably got parents that they're caring for. And then the church says, "Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you more work." You know? <laughs> yes. No. This the the, the primary uh, candidates for ministry and mission are the first generation, the first agers, zero to thirty. And the 60 to 90, they're the ones yes. that the church ought to be, we, we, to give some relief, <laughs> to help. How can we help these people in that second age that are trying to just keep juggling so many things? And how can we make it easier for you? And, you know, how, how, many, how, how many third agers w- would bless a, a family who they said, for one year, you have an evening a week hmm. on us? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That would be huge. We'll take care of your kids. We'll feed them. We'll come into your home. Mm-hmm. Give you relief. Just go out. Have a date. Mm-hmm. An evening or an evening every two weeks. An evening a month. Yeah. 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 I mean, why aren't we doing this? Yeah. Instead of, oh, we need, you need to work harder. You need to work harder. We need you to do this. No, no, no. We need to do this for you mm-hmm. to build up your marriage, to build up your family. Yeah. Bill had to get to know your kids. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That would be that'd be a game changer for a lot of young families or or that second age. Question about the first age and the third age. I feel like both of them are asking, what do I do with my life? <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I remember the pressure that I had back when I was a junior in high school trying to figure out what I'm gonna do. You know, what college am I going to go to? I mean, there's a lot of pressure there. Once you retire or you're in those retirement years, I hear of a lot of people talking about that their job in many ways was their identity or what they did. And now all of a sudden, what do I do? What is my contribution? How do you find um, that place of contribution? I mean, not in a micro, but macro. How do you do that if you're in that first or third age that are asking Mm -hmm. pretty much the same question? Yeah. Well, I think the third age is, is I mean, nobody in the Bible retired. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the word for retirement in the Bible is die. Right. You know. So retirement is something that we've come up with. I'm not opposed to it as long as it's a re, re-treading, you know, a mm-hmm. retire. I just got my, I had to change four tires yesterday. Can you believe it? It's 7,000 miles on a vehicle because <laughs> it's four-wheel drive. I had to retire the whole thing. But so re, to get some new treads, mm-hmm. get a new traction. But the traction is mission. This is the time when I can remission and right. re, re, this is my, where I make my greatest con- For the first stage, and this is where the church has not done this. I mean, I'm here today because at 13 years of age, all right, I got a call from my pastor. His name is Dr. Leonard Snow. And on a Friday night, and I'll forget this, like, just like yesterday. I'm I'm going out of the house to go to basket play basketball, and my mother says Dr. Snow's on the phone. This was not good news to me because he's never called me before. <laughs> and I thought, I'm in trouble now. I'm in trouble. Yeah, what did I do? <laughs> and it, to make a long story short, he he ended it with Leonard, your church needs you. Mm. Wow. And at 13, it's a 2,000 member church. He wanted me to be organist. At 13, I'd never played the organ before. 
but I did play the piano. But he said, it's, just forget about the keyboard. I mean, forget about the three other keyboards and forget about the pedals. Just play one keyboard and uh, your church needs you. And I could not say no to Dr. Stahl. Wow. So I became at 13 on the power of those words. Wow. Your church needs you. Wow. How many of our kids need to hear at 13? Your church needs you. Now, it may be another keyboard, you know, mm -hmm. electronic keyboard, mm -hmm. um, soundboard. Your church needs you. Yeah. How many are not hearing that? Yeah. And I would even say and echo that even for that third age. Yeah. Exactly. Your church needs you church too. Church needs you too. Yeah. yeah. They're the ones I think the church needs the most. Yeah. Yeah. Well, last uh, last question here is before we wrap, uh, we've kind of avoided that middle age, talking about the middle age and purpose and such like that. How how do they find their place in the midst of their careers, their rearing their families, the the craziness of your thirties and forties, and even sometimes into your fifties? Um, you have any advice for that? Yeah, I, th I think a I try and shift uh, my students and other people from a play work paradigm to a play paradigm. Hmm. So in the garden, we were not God didn't create us to work; God created us to play. All right, all creativity comes out of a play mode, not a work mode. Hmm. Um, God didn't, you know, you don't work a violin. Right. You play. You don't work basketball. You play basketball. Artistry, excellence, beauty, elegance come out of play. So we need a relationship with God and each other that's more play than work. I mean, and this is where the reform tradition has it right, the Westminster, um, the confession. You know, what is the, the catechism that every re reformed child learns? What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy, enjoy. God yes. forever. What does yeah. it mean to? You're not. Don't. Don't. You know. If you're stressing out, something. It, it's play. Play at at your job. Play at at your marriage. Play at raising kids. Make it play time. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't. You know. Jesus didn't come to. You know. Tell us how to. He's going to help make us work. It's. It, we're we're play, you, know, you play in the kingdom. First yeah. time we meet God, God's a play. You know, you know, making mud pies you know. <laughs> in Genesis. Yeah. yeah. So we we so whatever you're doing, move it from oh I got to work harder to what does it mean to play at this? Yeah. Can, Enjoy. And so life. You, but you yeah. to play you have to practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is practice. You know, to play. I mean, when you play the piano, there's a lot of practice. So to play at anything, there's a lot of practice. Yeah. But that also means for the church, to if we, we, we're going to play at our relationship with Christ and with Jesus, that means there's a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. So we, we are communities of practice, not perfection, but practice, where we're practicing our faith mm. so that we can play it better. It's good. Ah, it's good. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today and uh, appreciate it. This has been rich. And uh, I, again, am just very grateful for your time and for hey, all I'm your so investments. Thank yeah. you. Well, all right, City First, uh, we're going to take a moment and we're going to discuss this. We're going to discuss the intergenerational church and how we can lay down our preferences to surround ourselves around a priority of Jesus. All right, let's go ahead and talk. <laughs> 